We're going to look at paper members now. And in SRAM, you can define a model that has a member with different cross sections at the start and end joints, assuming that they have a linear taper. And what happens is SRAM will actually average the sections at the I and J nodes, at the start and end nodes, to determine the section property for that particular member. So let's try working with tapered members now. I have a new model within SRAM, and I'm just going to go to the Section Properties tool. And I right click on the Section Properties tool, and I can click on the Shapes button. Within this Shapes button here, we have the section type, and it can be configured between custom or tapered, and I'm going to choose the tapered option. And here I can specify the dimensions at the start and at the end nodes with this radio buttons. At the edit section at start node option here, I can either input the properties of the start node uh, in this spreadsheet here in these fields, or I can go to these shape options and I can left click on one of these shape options and just enter the, enter the dimensions. And that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to choose the I beam shape. And for the start section here, I'm going to give it a top flange width of 150 millimeters, top flange depth of 15 millimeters, a web depth of 200 millimeters, a web thickness of 8 millimeters, a bottom flange depth of 10 millimeters, and a bottom flange width of 120 millimeters. And then press OK. And you can see that this particular properties at start node option uh, fields are filled up. I'm then going to do the same thing, but I'm going to select the Edit Sections at End Node radio button here, and then I'm going to click on the I-beam shape once again. It remembers all the properties I entered before, so I don't have to re-specify them all, because I may not need to adjust them all. But I am going to change here the top flange width and depth or thickness. The web depth here is going to be 100 millimeters. And the bottom flange thickness is 8 millimeters, and the width of the bottom flange is 80 millimeters. I'm going to press OK, and you can see here, once again, it's calculated those properties for me at the end of it. And I could give this section a name. I'm just going to call it tapered section, and then press OK, or press add, sorry. And then you can see that it's added this tapered section to my model within the local database. And it just has one set of section properties. Again, what it's doing is it's averaging those properties throughout the length of the member. So it has an I node and a J node section, and it's averaging them up. Now I'm going to click Close, and you can see that section appears within my model. I'm just going to give it a different color so it stands out a little bit more. And to help me draw this, I'm going to create a grid of one meter. And I'm going to define a one meter long member. Actually, I'm going to define a couple of them here. So I'm going to click on uh, the member definition tool. I'm going to draw one member right here going from this joint to this joint. And by default, that's already inherited the section that I've defined. And I'm going to go in the other direction now from this joint here. This is going to be my I joint to the J joint right here. So the real difference here is that I defined this member this member was defined by starting with this joint and then going to this joint, so going from left to right. And this member here was defined from going right to left. And that will dictate the orientation of the I and J nodes and the local coordinate system. Now, if I go to the Section Properties tool, I can see that the tapered section is assigned to my model. And if I actually turn on the rendering, I can see the orientation of this taper as well. So one is tapering down as we go right, and one is tapering up. And that's all based on the direction that I've tapered this in, or defined these members in, sorry. Now I'm going to support both these members at just the one end. And I'm going to go to the loads window here. And I'm going to actually create a tip load locates. And just assign a 10 kilonewton tip load in the Z direction. So negative 10 kilonewtons at this free end. And we're going to save this model. So let's go File, Save As. 
I'm just going to give it a name. I called it tapered.tell. And I'm going to run an analysis. And we're going to run a linear static analysis. Again, keeping in mind that all we've got is supports at this one end and a tip load at the free end with the tapered sections. Click OK to run. We get a clean solution. And now if I look at some of the results, and maybe I'll turn off the rendering so I can see a little bit better. If I look at some of the results here, like deflections for this tip load load case, I can see the DZ uh, deflections here, 0.94 millimeters, is the same for both members. And we wouldn't expect that to be the case. But keep in mind here, what it's doing is for a single member, it's just averaging the section property at the start and the end node to apply to the whole member. So even though the directions are reversed, the average works out to be the same. Now for global results, this is certainly sufficient. However, if we're going to be looking at the orientation, uh, the tapered member, and take that into account, we probably want to do this by subdividing the member. So what I can do is I can go back into the geometry window. And I'm going to break this into smaller segments. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that the physical member modeling that we used in the previous exercise is turned off. So just make sure this toggle is turned off. So we don't want it to be one continuous member. And I'm going to go to Edit, Subdivide. And I'm going to break these members into five links from the I to J nodes. So I'll press OK. And you notice what happened now is it's broken that up into smaller segments, but it's maintained the section dimensions for each segment. So we have a gradually increasing section size as we go from left to right and right to left, depending on the orientation we're looking at. Now let's try running this again. Go Analyze. We'll go Analyze, run our linear static analysis. Once again, we get a clean solution. And now if I just toggle off the display of the rendered model to make it easier to see my deflections, here I can see that there is clearly a difference between the deflection diagrams in these two models. So we're getting 0.75 millimeters as a maximum on this member down at the bottom and 1.76 millimeters on this member up here. And as we would expect, the one that starts with a thicker or more stiff section closer to the base is leading to less deflection than the one that has its stiffest component further from the base. 